So the next speaker is Suzanne Rowe. Uh, Suzanne uh, Ag Agrisearch is foremost geneticist but strong advocate for the latest genetic methodologies as they apply to the dairy sheep industry. She'll be talking about breeding values for dairy sheep. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for that accolade. I want a breeding law. That's awesome. Okay, I'm going to start my presentation with um, hopefully some optimism. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing on, on breeding dairy sheep. Um, last year I spoke to you about some really fancy analyses. This year I've sort of reined it back and I'm just going to talk about some, some practical things we can do, some really simple practical ways that we can use the tools available um, for the dairy sheep industry. So this is my optimistic slide. And basically we're looking for, for curve benders. You know, we're looking for, for, for a sheep that performs beautifully, that survives in our environment. And evolution's done that so well for us over the years that so there are many, many examples. <coughs> These goats actually cut their metabolic rate in times of, of starvation, and they can, they can cut their diet by around 55% and cheerfully survive all winter. These sheep live on toxic diets, quite happily on the beach eating seaweed. Anything, anything else would die, so that there are always genetic solutions, which is why we should have a breeding law. Okay, so what, what, how, how have we done this in, in New Zealand? New Zealand is a real success story, so I think I wanted to remind us of that before we go any further. New Zealand, New Zealand is our innovators and the, the global tools, the, the genomic tools that have been created for the international sheep industry all started here. So they've all, 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 all been created internationally um, within New Zealand. And in fact, when you look at your meat industry, you have 31 million ewes. Now that ewe flock has halved, but production stayed exactly the same over a few decades. And that's because of a cooperative breeding structure, just as been described here today, um, just as successful, $100 going out the door, $14 put on by genetics in the, in the last few decades. So the structure is here, the systems are here, the ability to do it is here and the tools are here. So I think actually the New Zealand dairy sheep industry has a really, really strong platform to start from. And this again is, is your, your standard breeder's curve. And I just wanted to highlight that this is what it's all about, finding these top animals. Until we find these top animals, we don't go anywhere. And if we want to go quickly, first of all, we need a trait that's heritable. If it's not genetic, we can't breed for it. But once we know it's genetic, and we identify these guys right at the top here, then we move forward. And suddenly our averages move forward, and away we go. We're on, on, this, on this train of genetic gain, leaving these low producers behind. And the speed at which we go is linear, and it's dependent entirely on how accurately we pick the top animals. So as long as we measure these animals really well, there's the rub, and, and, and select these top animals, then we're going to get the greatest genetic gain that we can. And obviously, with, with turnover of generation, th comes speed. I'm not going to dwell on that, because um, John gave us a really, really nice talk. So again, I'm just going to give a, a simple, practical talk on, on some tools that we've been using to help out the guys at Spring Sheep um, to, to, to start up their breeding program. And they've got a dairy sheep flock with an unknown genetic base, um, recording 3,100 years daily, uh, but no pedigree information. So no real way of identifying um, who, who, who the top animals are in terms of, of breeding varies going forward. So, so the challenge was to identify the best use, um, to find rams for selection candidates, alongside the, the importation of exotic genetics, and to identify ewe lamb replacements. So how do we find the best animals? Well, it isn't obviously just what we see. Uh, we know that there are there are impacts on feeding, management, environment, and health that we have to account for. Uh, we also know that we can gain information from animals' relatives to, to create breeding values. And genomics is a really practical tool for this because in the absence of any pedigree information, if we don't know how related our animals are, actually, if we just do a very simple DNA test and we use DNA just simply as a barcode, then we can track things like relationships. We can see parentage. We know if an animal's inbred by how many markers are inbred. We can screen for, for known polymorphisms like, like scrapie alleles, and, and we can estimate genetic merit. 
tools available at the moment vary in density, but, the, but there's a huge, huge range out there, so, so we can pick the tool for the job. Um, if we want to screen some, a, a very expensive RAM, if we want to know a lot about it, we can go high density. But if we want to do something fairly simple like parentage, we can go cheap and low density and, and get a really effective result. And then we have some, some sequencing methods to, to back that up. So plenty available to us. And th these are genetic relationships created by genomics. Um, these are the first, first eight animals in the flock. And, and this is the relationship. So, so one and one, that's the relationship of animal one with animal one. If it's one, there's absolutely no inbreeding at all. If it's two, it's about to fall over because it's completely inbred and probably biologically impossible for a sheep. Um, so, so these animals, that animal there we'd start to be cautious about. We'd start thinking, well, that the inbreeding rate is, is going up. These animals we wouldn't be too concerned about. And this is the relationship of the animals with each other. And we can see that animal four has a relationship with animal six and animal eight. They're probably half sibs, but actually share 30% of the genes between animal four and eight, but only 20% between animal four and six. So this is a really easy, quick way of looking at your flock and saying, well, which animals are related to whom? Um, who, might, who might I mate to whom? Where have I gone wrong in my pedigree? What, what is my parentage? And it's just a really quick visual summary. Another thing that we can do with genomic relationships is actually work out breed proportions. Um, we have access to the International Sheep Genome Consortium, so there are hundreds of breeds there. There's 3,000 animals that have been genotyped with 50,000 markers, and I've just pulled off a few, few just for fun. Uh, this is Romney, these are Finns, these are East Frisians, brown and white. These green dots here, that's the milk lacoon, that's the meat lacoon. These are the, the Spanish churra. Um, what I've got over here, some Awasis and some improved Awasis. And these are the Barbados black belly sheep, just in case you're interested to see where they sit in the world. So it's, it's pretty easy for us to, to take those relationships and, and, then, and then plot animals here. And, and for spring sheep, that's exactly what we did when we were looking at the flock and looking at the proportion of East Frisian genetics across that flock and which ones sat, sat at the pure end and which one came back more to the, the sort of traditional New Zealand breeds. So for phen phenotypic prediction, so ranking these sheep first from, from pre from, for a phenotype, we had 420,000 records from 3,100 lactations. So that's being spelled out from the milk meters. We probably ended up with about half. So data is still quite patchy. Even though you're, you, you've got automatic meters, you don't necessarily get two good records per day per you. Um, that's a myth. Um, but, but, but you still get a lot of useful data. Uh, we adjusted all of these records for things like lambing date, age of ewe, the number of lambs born, the live weight of the view, the ewe, any, any health events, and the mob that she was in, so any management effects. And then we fitted a statistical curve to fill in all that missing data. And what we ended up then is a lactation curve for every single individual sheep using all the, all the data that that sheep had provided. And that's a really nice tool for starting to look to see how those ewes are performing. And it's going to be really great when we get more genetics in to see how the shape of those lactation curves change as, as we improve the genetics. Um, so we then had an estimated total yield. And I, I, just, I just want to reiterate that we have this beautiful data set then that's ranked and we've done some really nice curves. We'd still only see about 20 to 25% of genetic gain if we use those rankings. So we have to go that extra step and add in the genetics and add in the information from relatives that gives us that greater accuracy when we're selecting our breeding candidates. And that's what we've done. We've taken the predictions for yield and we've added in these genomic relationships. And basically what we're saying is if relatives consistently have, have, a, have an amount that's associated with them and we get an animal that's, that's related, then we can upweight the accuracy with which we believe that breeding value. Um, we can also, so we adjust animals for information from relatives. And then finally, we can predict a phenotype in animals with no phenotype. So if this is a lamb that's just hit the ground and we do a DNA profile and it's got this pattern of markers, we've got a training set, we look back at the previous data from the flock and we say, okay, this one's likely to be a suitable candidate. So we've already got a screening process going on at birth. And this, this is just to sort of re reiterate and highlight that fact. These are the breeding values for the, for the, for the ewes that had information on them, genotype and phenotype. So this is the difference from the flock mean for e each of their phenotypic values. So this ewe, for example, she gave 40 litres above the average. 
but her breeding value is actually less than average. You wouldn't choose her. If you'd chosen her just from, from ranking phenotypically, you'd have cheerfully put her, put her forward as a candidate. But actually, she's obviously been downweighted by, by information from her, from, from her progeny, from, from her siblings, and these guys are the ones that you want to pick. So although the trend is very strong and phenotype matches genotype, in actual fact, these guys you get to eradicate and you really make sure that you pick the top and that progress is as fast as you want it to be. And for the future, we have genomic tools so we can continue to characterize these flocks. We can do high density screening for these imported sires and we can track breeding progress. Most importantly, we make informed decisions when we use these tools. Um, we manage mating. We know what our inbreeding is. We can track changes in gene frequencies. If we have health and su survival traits, we can monitor them. We can look for genomic signatures. We can look for international genomic signatures that we might screen for. Uh, Scrapie is one of the obvious ones. Um, and finally, obviously, we'll start to incorporate other traits into a selection index. Uh, be that by measuring those traits or actually using genomic information from other areas. And this, this is just to end up, because I said it was a practical talk, just to tell you how to actually do it. And all we do is send out this, this ear-punching bit of kit. M many of you probably know this already. Um, with this little tube, and it's got a, an EID on it. And basically, you can get them with ear tags. You punch a hole in the ewe's ear. That immediately puts a little bit of tissue in here, post it to the lab, and everything else is done by robot following this EID through. It's all high throughput. Goes through on, on one of these sniff arrays, which basically I think this one takes 24 animals, through a sequencer, and, and out the other end comes the information. So it's, it's a reasonably straightforward process. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to say that in February 2018, about 1,000 international geneticists are going to descend on New Zealand. Uh, we have the privilege of hosting the, the World Congress. Um, we'll try and get a dairy sheep session in there. I'll be talking to, you, to some of you about um, possible opportunities for, for running a session. Maybe you uh, might want to be involved in, in, in sponsorship or, or visits. But, but there will be many, many geneticists on our soil at that point for probably a couple of weeks as an ICAR meeting at the same time. So if anybody wants to take advantage of that, then uh, give, give me a shout or Nicholas. And I think that's me.